Uh, so thank you. Yeah. So thank you for having me. Um, uh, we are going to talk about. Uh, we are not going to be too much technique, right? I, I really wanted to make a panorama of um, of the databases, but we are going to 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 go a little bit in technique. But I, I will I will really guide you there uh, easily in a way for you to have the sense of um, um, how hardware and software are related. And uh, when I when I was working in, in this presentation initially, I, I find that really fascinating because I rediscovered things that I used to know, <laughs> but I forgot about. I forgot about. So it was really nice to to rediscover those things and uh, to share them with you. You see that it's a, it's a nice historical journey and also. Uh, uh, really exciting uh, things to discover, and 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 the, the the future database is really bright. So we are going to see that in, in detail. Um, so the the topic is oh, so it's a journey about databases, uh, starting from pr primitive file system because this is the the before I think really those tools called databases we were just storing files in, in some way uh, to database that you probably uh, use today that are on the cloud, that are distributed. And uh, so there is um, a, a lot of things uh, in between. And I just uh, checked this sentence um, from George Satanayana. I didn't know this philosopher, but I knew the sentence. So th that, that say, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Right? So if you don't know where you come from, uh, it's difficult to know where you are going because you can you can just repeat the same thing that has been has been created already, right? Or if you if you if you don't know where you came from, you cannot go know where you go. You know, you need you need first a, a first position to to see on the map where you are, and then you can decide where you can go, right? So there is many different way of of um, uh, interpreting this sentence. But I really think that if we know where we come from, we we can go how to go further, and that exactly is the idea of this uh, presentation. Quickly about, about myself, uh, and after I will stop talking about myself. <laughs> um, I'm software engineer at CyrilDB, as you said, you know, I have, uh, I'm French, as you can tell. Uh, I'm sorry for my English. I'm, I'm here for five years, and if, if something is difficult to understand, please let me know. Uh, so I don't see the chat, but I mean, I, if you, just stop me if you, so someone is asking for something or so for me to repeat something. Um, French, I have, um, a 20 year now career as a software engineer, I didn't even have this, this number in mind. Uh, I have been to different roles in my career, but always uh, and on and always coding, uh, always uh, uh, in a technical way. So I have been software engineer, of course, CTO, startup founder, product manager. And my, my I, th I think my, my form manager at Redis is here to today. <laughs> And um, so, yeah, a really, a really uh, nice career where I, I have the ability to work in, David, in really a lot of different domains. Um, I'm senior, as you can tell. Uh, when I started the computers, we were using BASIC. We learned uh, first BASIC. I, I work also on Pascal. I work on C, and I have, I have a few years working on C and C++. I have a long story in Java because um, uh, uh, Java is, has become really uh, preeminent in, in 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 database as well, right? We all know Elasticsearch, and you see that based on Java. And for a few years now, I, I am uh, I'm working with Rust, and CyrilDB is, is a database developed with Rust. So we are we are really really focusing on Rust uh, now. I wrote a, a database, the first database in 1993. Um, I, I have created a, a software, we call that shareware. So I, I may ask, do you know guys what shareware are? If, if you know, you can maybe put that in the, in the chat. A shareware, right? It, it is written there, you can see the... I'm not sure if I can see the chat now, I can see, yeah, I can see it. No. I not see. really, I see not really, okay. <laughs> <laughs> shareware, um, so in in... Open source, you know, open source software, right? Of course, but at some point there is this idea of uh, this, this fear that open source would not. Um, before open source, we have what we call free software, and for free software, there is no such support uh, with contribution, people paying. There were no cloud. There, there is nothing that could um, that free software developer could rely on to to make money. So shareware was uh, the idea of okay, my software is free. You can use it for free. But if you like it, it would be nice to send me a little bit of money. And so that was called shareware. Everybody that was using it 
was welcome. It was a contribution model, right? The same way Wikipedia is asking us, you know, five pounds or five dollars, depending on where you are. You probably saw that on Wikipedia at some point. You have a pop up saying, "Hey guys, you can contribute." So shareware was a name for the software that that was asking for contribution. And I wrote this software uh, for for Macintosh. Uh, in 1993, and um, and uh, and I, I I need to have a database. So it was my first contact as a software developer uh, uh, in writing a database. And uh, we will see that I I wrote um, a linear storage database. We will talk about that later. A really basic database. This first one. Uh, I made a lot of SQL. I, like everybody, I think here, I mean, I use MySQL, PostSQL, PostgreSQL, um, SQL Server, Oracle, SQLite, which is an embedded uh, engine or library that, that, that provide SQL on, uh, as a library that you can bring in your in your application. And uh, NoSQL, I, I, I used to embed Berkeley DB, which is an embedded library as well. Elasticsearch based on Lucene, which is a, um, a NoSQL uh, inverted index. Redis uh, uh, in memory and um, and and not only and uh, and Lucene I, I talk about it as a library. Okay, that's me. Uh, a last thing about me: my first computer. So so it was me. I think I was probably thirteen or fourteen when I bought my first computer. And my first computer because we are going we're going to have an historical journey, right? My first computer was a Lynx. For computers limited, it was a British one. It was French, and so it was my first contact with 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 England. And uh, and this computer um, had forty eight kilobytes of memory. So I I don't know if you can imagine what it means. I don't know if you guys uh, have been uh, using a computer with such a small amount of of memory, but it was uh, challenging. In the same time, in nineteen ninety three, Microsoft was releasing. Uh, Word 1.0, it was the first release of Word uh, that was working on this on, on DOS, disk operating system on PC. Um, there were no Macintosh at this point. L Lisa was the first computer uh, that Apple uh, created with a user interface, uh, the first commercially and widely distributed computer, the Lisa. Uh, the tennis player was John McEnroe and uh, Navra Martil Martinova, if I remember the name exactly, yeah. Uh, Michael Jackson was releasing Beat It. He it was asking, starting his solo career. <laughs> and uh, ARPANET, uh, which then became internet later, was still ARPANET and just decided to use TCP IP as a network layer that then, I think 12 years after, become uh, really internet. So it was really a moment uh, uh, when I start uh, being in touch with computer where there were no network, there is quite no storage, uh, there is a, a really, really limited uh, amount of capabilities in computers, and um, and uh, that was really interesting for for me. So just to to give you the context of where I start from, and you will see that I will do the parallel with what happened to database, and it's pretty it's pretty related. Um, we cannot talk about database without data. Uh, if we talk about data, of course, data is everywhere. I, I don't think I need to make that, I mean, a long story about the role of data in, in the digital age, right? I mean, but even before it was true. But uh, clearly, we can we can say that uh, business are, are now uh, data-driven. I mean, there is no business, successful business that are not using data to, for, for making decisions. Um, the targeted marketing. I mean, we we all know that when we go on Google and we go on a web on an e-commerce website, or we have uh, we have a promotion for product that we just seen earlier. Um, innovation and product development does not exist without collecting data. Uh, operational efficiency is about uh, supply chains, or, or a company will will optimize is uh, supply chain depending of of data. So that's an example. Uh, the way it impacts our life. If we think about personal finance. Uh, credit score is data, data, data powered. Right? Credit score is based on the history of our own records. Health and wellness is you have a, you have records that follow you all the time. I mean, whatever, whatever the care is about. Education um, uh, is about collecting uh, and and all the information from the different steps that you have been at school, right? And, and collecting data about. Uh, um, which material you, you study, what, whatever your results, and so on. Uh, consumer experience um, recommendation, product recommendation is part of the consumer experience based on data, AI, and, uh, and other things. Um, 
um, the public life, public policy and governance, voting is data. Um, uh, deciding um, if you are going to create a new road, a new motorway, depend on the traffic, it's data. Um, healthcare policy, if you think about COVID, uh, you probably all have been, I did that, I, but I was not alone in checking every morning Wordometer, the website that was collecting all the information about the number of people having um, the COVID per country and to, to know where we were standing, if it was getting worse or getting better. Um, economic planning, uh, it's about inflation, uh, GPD, I mean, all the information about um, uh, all decisions that a government will take uh, about taxation is powered, powered by, by data. Climate change is powered by all the data gathered by all these scientists uh, uh, over the world. Okay. We, we can continue. I, I, I put, yeah, I talk about uh, creation of new industries. A few years ago, it was uh, this big data uh, movement. Uh, so it was an industry that was created because the, the, the need of collecting and managing uh, a lot of data. Um, global connectivity. Uh, when, when we take your credit card, you can have your English account be in the US and you can pay with it because there is data flow, right? So it means that. Uh, we are all connected, right? And you can do that, do that mostly all, all around the world. Same to Visa. Redis is using Visa, if I'm not wrong. And uh, other opposite. Um, risk management. In agriculture, we use the, uh, the, the weather information to take decisions about uh, how we are going to, uh, which kind of uh, things we are going to do in this field, uh, depending of, of uh, rain or rain and so on. So it's, it's the data power. So data is everywhere. And... Data is useless if we don't have a database, because database is the tools that we use to collect, store, um, uh, and um, and uh, yeah, to, to manage all those data and, and retrieve them. Okay. That and it brings me to database definition, and I I, I took a definition that is pretty broad but pretty right. I mean, it's a structured collection of data that allow efficient storage, retrieval, and manipulation. And I will show you a database. So th this is a database. Because often we associate the term database with, um, with, with computers. No, in fact, um, we, we have paper and pen for ages, and, and we are using database in different form. And data was already a part of our lives and, uh, and, and with them. So a book is a, is a, is a database, right? So this is, a, a, I'm going to play music to tomorrow and, and we have this book and each page is, the, is, is some music. And it, it's even closer to a database because in the first page, I have the list of the song, which is an index on, on, the, on the, the songs that are then in the book. So if I... If I see this one, I know it's page one, and I know that my song is on page one. So that's a database. Uh, and a pretty modern one. And we'll see that it is a modern one. Um, another kind of database is still a book. This one is interesting because it has pr a primary key. If you look at the table of contents, the table of contents is is structuring all my data with um, you know pages and and chapter numbers. You can see that as uh, each chapter is uh, a document, and you can say that my primary key is my table co of content. And I even have an inverted index. Inverted index. The inverted index is at the end when for each terms, they are telling on which page I could have reference to this term. This is an inverted index or glossary, but it's exactly the same kind of thing that we, we see in digital database. So I just wanted to show that uh, database is, is not a new concept. And the concept that we use in database today uh, didn't require computers for scientists to think about how to improve the way we store, we retrieve, and we manipulate data. Database to the past. So to go on this topic, um, uh, so we store data for, for a long time, right? So the, in 3,500 before uh, zero, so in the Gregorian cal calendar, right? So I, I think it's a Sumerian that was 
the, the first record we have for people storing information, and it's really storing information, right? It's, just, it's not just about dry, drawing something. It, it's about a meaning with data, with some semantic, uh, semantic and, and the idea is to, to store this information. So we have that already in stones. In stones, there, is, there were database in stones. Of course, after we had uh, papyrus, we had pen, so it was around zero. It was it was the the, la, the, la, the first record we have of this uh, was in China, uh, where we had those um, um, those um, those paper pen, which are pretty modern and pretty the same thing that what we are using today. And the funny thing with all of those is that there were the same kind of concern that we have today with databases um, accessibility. How can I read this book? Where can I find it? It's about accessibility. Uh, durability. Uh, what is the persistence of my book, my ink? How long is it, is it going to persist? I mean, if you think about hard disk, we have the same kind of concern, right? And hard disk as a end of life, a MTBF, which is the, 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 the moment where the, the hard disk is going to not work anymore. Uh, storage issues, because if you have a lot of books, you need place to, to store them. Uh, searchability, or do you find this? We, we all make this experience in libraries. If you go in a library, you need to find a book. You have to understand the way the library is organized, where are each um, main topics and, and so on. Error and corrections. Uh, if you are using a stone, uh, making correction is really difficult. If you are using ink, maybe you already have the ability to remove it with the ink and, and write. But error and correction is a, con a concern. And we have the same kind of thing on databases. And security. Uh, who can access my book? Because maybe I want to protect information because it contains private information. So, um, so again, uh, uh, physical ledger on books already have concerns that are not so different than the concerns that we have today with uh, the, the digital age. Um, from 2000, so, two, so minus, three, minus 3,500 to zero to uh, the printing press, so that is interesting because now we start uh, having immutable data, right? Because we are going to print uh, things that are going to be shared with, with many people, thanks to Bitumber. Uh, it's pretty recent, if you think about time, right? So it's five, 500 uh, years ago, and we start making copies. So this is what about, uh, this is about manual record keeping, but, but database. Let's go to the digital era because we don't say we want to talk about code and, and, and algorithm and all of things after. So um, computers, a quick a glimpse on, on computers because uh, for computers to, man to manipulate data, we need, uh, we need um, of course, a computer, computer capabilities. Bell transistor, the first transistor has been created in 1947. Uh, just after that, I don't know if you see, can see this, point, this pointer, can you see it? If I put the pointer here, can you see something? No, I don't think you can. Yes, yes. Oh, you can. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So it's useful because then I can point to things. So yeah, this was the first ship in 1958. Um, uh, they managed, uh, it was Jack Kilby, a Texas instrument, that managed to put several transistors is in, in the first um, uh, integrated circuit. Um, in 1959, we have the Xerox 914, which was the first photocopier. In 1964, uh, we have the first supercomputer. And uh, looks it starts looking a little bit like a modern computer, right? Because we see that there is a large thing, which is storage. The storage behind, by the way, is just memory. There were no storage. It was an in-memory thing, like Redis. And, uh, and then you have uh, this keyboard here. And I, I collect some information about the capacities of this thing. And yeah, so it, it was a processor that was running at 10 megahertz. And I can tell that it was a superconductor because uh, a supercomputer because my links was only running at four megahertz. And it was a few, year, a few years after. So it was already going 2.5 times faster than mine. It has one megabyte on, of memory, which was more than my computer. Was a, I had only 48. And it was able to manage 3 million floating point operations per second. So it was really a computer. And most of the algorithm that have been developed and that we are going to see after uh, has been created uh, by scientists at this moment because the mechanism of uh, the mechanism, the computer logic was already 
uh, theorized. Right? We, they already knew how it was going to to be managed, and it was then the time to develop the algorithm that then would be used. Uh, you will see that we are going to see algorithms that have been created in the seventies uh, that are still major today, even in the in the era of vector and AI, vector database and AI. Uh, then if you compare with this, which is an iPhone 11, so an iPhone 11 is 2.65 gigahertz. So it's 265 times faster. And there is four gigabyte of memory. It's 4,000 more memory than, than the, the Cray, the CDC 6,600. And it can manage one trillion operation per second, which is 300 times faster than the superconductor. Okay, so, but, it did not change really in a sense, right? It changed in capacity, but not really in, in, in a sense, and that's interesting. In 1977, uh, start the era of the personal computer. There was this true computer there, uh, that, uh, and then people start having computer in, in, in the home, and the six years after I bought, I bought mine. Okay, we have the computers. Uh, we need a storage system because we want to store data. Quick journey on, on historical. Um, it started with punch card. You probably knew the, the, those things. Um, the interesting thing is it, women, women was often uh, the people uh, pointing, I mean, ma making the, the hole on the card, taking the, the, so the software developed by the developers and um, putting that uh, uh, punching the card uh, and operating the system at the end. Um, punch cards. Punch cards was already existing in, in the 19th centuries because there were computers, logical computers, right? Uh, I mean, logical. There were computers that was uh, mechanic computers that was working. So we didn't need a super con uh, yeah, superconductor or integrated circuit or even transistor to have computers. So there were already that kind of automatic machine, right? Uh, there is this this machine that make music, you know, with uh, the punch card. I don't remember the name. Do you, do you guys remember? I, I should have put that in the presentation. But uh, yeah, as you turn and make music, so it it was a kind of computer in some way. At least it was using punch card uh, to 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 make the music. Okay, the digital era started in in the fifties. Uh, there were magnetic tapes. So this is interesting because magnetic tapes are still used today for offline storage. So initially it was this big thing, uh, but today you have, uh, of course, smaller mechanisms. But it's, it's, it's te technically the same thing. We still make a backup of database of data in magnetic tapes. And it's a way to make, put them offline because when they're offline, uh, no hacker can anymore uh, destroy your data. So if you want really to protect your data, you put them offline. Magnetic tapes, uh, we, we have at this form at this moment and now a much smaller form are still in use. Magnetic drums, um, this is a magnetic drums. It, it is the ancestor of the hard drive. Uh, it has been replaced so by the hard drive. The hard drive, the modern hard drive is here. They were bigger, but the magnetic disk, the hard disk drive, has been created in the 50s, in the same time, just after the magnetic drums, and still used today, right? If you go to Amazon Glacier, as an example, when you use Amazon Glacier, uh, the storage is handled uh, uh, by magnet, by hard disk drive, magnetic disk, because they are less expensive and uh, they can store more data. And they are slow, of course, compared to solid state drives. But uh, they are still in use uh, because of the cost, right? and uh, yeah, and and you you may have old computer. I still have thing. I one one or two computers with magnetic disk, but still used today uh, for for the cost of the storage. There there were a moment of floppy disks uh, for for in the beginning of the personal computers until two thousand, uh, which is persistent storage as well. We have optical storage. We all probably still know the, the CD for, for music, but of course it was used for storage, storing data and still used uh, for storing data uh, for the same reason, exactly the same purpose of uh, magnetic tape uh, to, to have offline records and more practical because much, much smaller. And uh, the modern disk, uh, hard drive, sorry, it was strange. The modern hard drive uh, is based on the flash and uh, it has two forms, the flash drive and the solid state drives. 
uh, that provide uh, faster access, and we talk about it later. This brings us um, to the model, to the, to the to the real world. I mean, the world of today, to the present. Is it okay? <laughs> so, if I don't know if there is any question here, here now, I don't see the chat, but is everything okay? Should be okay. I go on. Um, I have a question to ask now, which is um, when you log on your computer, uh, maybe it can, it can be a Mac, in my case, it will be a Mac or Windows, it will be more, more or less the same thing. Uh, how many databases do you think are involved uh, when you log in your Mac OS? And maybe you can put that in the chat. This is not a good answer. Well, well it's, it's quite a good answer. Oh, OK. Clever Cesar, clever. I mean, you cannot be wrong. <laughs> well, it could be wrong if we would have less than 10, but. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, 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 I see some uh, some good example. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I will not answer immediately, so we can you can still um, have an idea. But um, we we may have one good re response and two if I if I include the, the bigger than. <laughs> Okay, let's log in. Let's log in and, and, and let's see what is happening when, when we log in. I, so I do that on Mac, but it's the same on Windows. It's just the service of another main, as an, another name. It's probably pretty similar as well in Linux, maybe a little bit less with Linux, but uh, not far from there. Um, so the first thing that macOS is doing, uh, it, it's using already a really complex database, uh, which is an open directory for user authentication because uh, LDAP, LDAP, LDAP is a, a typical database, specialized database for, you know, probably it's and uh, used for ages, non, non also because it replicates well for storing um, um, users and groups and organizations. So yeah, it uses LDAP. So it starts by using the open directory, uh, which is um, a, a first a first database, a user database. We have one. Uh, but then, uh, so the LDAP will provide may store the password, but in fact, uh, on macOS, the passwords uh, and certificates are not stored on the LDAP directly. They are stored in the keychain, which is another database. So we have a, a second database that is the keychain that, that will contain your encrypted password, uh, but also certificates and, and, and many other uh, encrypted information used by different services. Keychain. Um, okay, we have Spotlight. Uh, we have Spotlight. Uh, uh, of course, you didn't make any search. So Spotlight uh, is the service that um, provides the search capabilities in, in macOS. So when you are searching for a file, searching for whatever on your computer, uh, you use this icon, this um, icon on, on on the top on the on the menu bar. But which so it's Spotlight. It's called Spotlight. Uh, the thing is that um, Spotlight is ready to maybe uh, index something that uh, that is a new file or whatever. So it starts uh, a daemon, and this daemon will immediately uh, load the database, which is an inverted index. So we have Spotlight. Um, but then you have also the settings. Uh, the first application that the macOS is, is launching is the Finder. The Finder is what shows the, the, the folders, the files, and the, and the menu, and everything you can interact with. Uh, so, and this thing has settings. And settings are stored uh, in something called uh, a property list. And uh, it's a database, a pretty primitive one, but, uh, but, but it's one. And so applications, so I don't know, we are, we are four. Uh, but then uh, we, we, are, we, we have connected, com uh, co connected computers, right? So we are, we are probably connected to a Wi-Fi and, uh, and we need to, and, but not only, so we need to read system configurations. 
uh, it's, it's, there is system configurations for the network, the Wi-Fi, um, the the pointers, the size of the pointer. The are you using um, the color of your background, the image you use for your background? Many settings are, are stored, and they are all small applications that each of them may use different uh, databases. Uh, so. I don't know. I don't know how many there is, there is, but there is probably something about 15, 50 or sixty, maybe one hundred already, uh, just because of the system configuration, uh, small applications that are reading information. But maybe they are not all alive in the moment where we we log. But uh, network, of course, uh, the everything related to the user interface, uh, accessibility, uh, yeah, many things. System configuration. Caches. Uh, there is caches all around a a comp uh, an operating system, uh, and a cache is a database. Uh, is a database which is usually simple, like a key-value database, uh, but with something specific called eviction. So it's uh, based on LRE, right? So it's a typical uh, database, pretty simple. But uh, and there is many of them. Uh, as soon as you resolve a, a, a domain name, so if you if you would go with Safari on on a website, we, we have to resolve, you type uh, www.meetup.com, but it has been to resolve to an IP address. And this information is stored locally in a cache. So this is one of many, but there is many, many, many of the cache that uh, I used. Uh, I just show Safari, but there is already system cache. Uh, the file system itself has cache, and we already read a lot of files, so we have some from, from things in, in memory already, already, which is a database in memory. Cache, file system meta, metadata. We already read some files because those databases that already have been alive uh, read some information from files. So we already read uh, the file system, which itself is a database. And we will see the main uh, algorithm behind uh, a file system and a file system is files is pointer inode uh, but also met metadata 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 yeah so many many information from file system um there is few applications that uh, run in the background uh, if you have an email you are going to have a notification and the reason why you, you can have that is because uh, the mail has started a, a daemon that already um, uh, read the content of the the mailbox to read the settings to know which mailbox to to collect the email from and so on and so on. So there is for each application that may um, provide a notification, you probably have a daemon running that already um, load the database. How many? Probably dozens. Uh, or software update, as an example. As an, as an example. Um, logs. Logs is a really primitive form of database, uh, but surprisingly, it's not always only just text. Uh, it can be structured data, even with indexes. So some, so you take the, the Diag as an example uh, from Siri, uh, which is logging things all the time. Believe me, if you have a look at this log, you will be surprised. And and um, and it's a structured uh, log uh, with uh, an index. So it's it's a primitive database. And there is few logs, right? so so already probably dozens of, of logs. So user database, caching, caching, spotlight, application settings, system configuration, caches, file system metadata, application specific and logs. Uh, in this slide, I, I show a little bit, the, I already talked about it, so the different kind of, um, of uh, database involved. Um, I talk about HTML, LRU, property list and so on. So there is a lot of them. I don't have the answer to how many databases have been opened, but I'm pretty sure that it's it's hundreds. It's clearly hundreds. And and uh, I make the and, and we have the first code for tonight. So it's woman in code. I'm happy to put some code. <laughs> it's just a bash. It's just a, a command where we use Elsoft to see so SQLite is a pretty common uh, database used by application, and um, and uh, for persistence, the it stores files that end with SQLite. It can it, it can use another suffix, but it's often used with the default suffix. So 
we, so we are not going to see any SQLite database that are not using the SQLite suffix. But for the one that are still using the default one, um, I just checked how many SQLite files are open, which means that they are uh, in memory at this moment. So it means that I didn't collect the database that has been opened and closed, right? And probably there were there, there, there have been many. So we don't have this information. We just have here the SQLite database that are currently operated by uh, demand in memory. And there is 46 of them. So we have 46 SQLite instance running at this moment, uh, which are the ones that are live. And it's just SQLite. There is probably many others. So yeah, it's hundreds. Hundreds are database of different and different kinds of database. And this is really interesting. SQL and NoSQL. SQLite is SQL. So we have and SQL Light is a pretty advanced database with indexing, with many different uh, uh, modern things. And uh, yeah, really advanced. And, and so we have primitive database and pretty complex database already in memory that would never fit in my links uh, with 40K kilobytes of memory, right? So this is the reason why we need gigabyte of memory today in a, in a modern computer. Okay. That's brief. <laughs> And let's go to a uh, database in the digital age and talk about um, what databases are. So uh, we, we leave now the book and the papyrus and all those things, and let's talk about uh, the, the state of the art today. So what are databases in the digital age? Uh, definition of database, we already talked about it. Um, first thing, it can be persistent or not persistent, stay in memory. So Redis is the, the, the iconic example of database residing in memory. And um, it's a form of persistence, by the way, right? It's just not persistent across uh, restarting, but it's already persistent in memory. And it might, so this is the reason why we say it might reside on disk. We often say that persistence is on disk, but in fact, persistence is already on memory. There is even a project with Intel, and think, I think Redis is working on that with Intel, uh, on having memory, persistent memory that, that stay alive even when you restart a computer. So persistence is not necessarily on disk, even if it is commonly used for fade uh, for that. Yeah. Uh, a database can vary in complexity. It can be really simple. A key value store is a database. Uh, but we could, uh, of course, we have a more complex database, including relational database. Um, and uh, it can be a SQL or no SQL, right? We can have a, a lang uh, elaborate language to make queries, but we can also make queries in different forms. Elasticsearch is an example of database where we are using uh, JSON to make a query. There's other way, but uh, historical. Um, a database can be embedded in an application. It does not need to be a, a, a demon or something running on its own by itself. It can be embedded in any application, or it can operate as a standalone system. Uh, and uh, and then we, we talk about a database management system. So the term DBMS is for um, uh, having on top of the algorithm related to the, the database, uh, all the mechanism like connecting to the database, like making a query, which language I use for the query. So all, everything related to the data operation and everything that goes around the concurrent access, as an example, the consistency, integrity, everything out there. So, but database and DBMS are often used, um, um, uh, are using interchangeable, you can say that, yeah. Okay, database. Um, there, there, there is, there is not, there is not a lot of different kind of databases. So we are going to see that really quickly. I'm uh, going to see that they, there is not such a, a big diversity in the kind of databases. The past technology, technology that uh, we needed to go to the, to them to discover the the field, but they are not anymore running. Um, manual record keeping, keeping. This is the papyrus on those things. Uh, in the digital era, we have something called hierarchical and network databases. Hierarchical is a file system, right? With folders and, and files. So the, the primitive uh, way of organizing data. Uh, so IBM was the company uh, building those, those, things, those things. There were Codacil, uh, which was uh, also creating something related to, it was network database was called. It was finally the ancestor of the relational database the way we know it. 
uh, today. And it was also the, the team that introduced COBOL as a language because it was not only about um, storing data, but also the way you would query the database to, to, to collect data. data. Uh, Codacil, those are not existing anymore. And, and there were in the 80s, something, 90s, something called object-oriented database, which the idea, because we were more and more coding with uh, oriented objected languages, so the idea was to have uh, something that goes directly to, from the code to the, to the storage. Uh, that, that was nice, but uh, it's the, the, the decoupling uh, database and, and the object model makes sense. The physical layer, the logical layer are different, and and it was not really working well at the end. Uh, and today we are more using solutions like Protobuf. You know, when we want to serialize objects and and make them persistent in the in the database, there is many other way that are more useful. So it was an attempt to have something a little bit new, but uh, it, did, it didn't persist. Okay, today's technology. So what do we have? What are the databases that we use today uh, every day? Uh, and when when did uh, when have they have they been created? So the everything starts uh, mostly the modern database start with this paper uh, from someone working at IBM in 1917, 19, yeah, 1970s. Um, uh, it's 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 a six page, seven page um, document. I, I encourage you to read it because it's really interesting because uh, it's a little bit dated in the form, but in the content it already uh, give some good indication of everything we are doing today. Uh, so relation model of data, data for large shared data banks. So it's really part of the way of uh, the modern database, the concept of table, columns, indexes, every, everything everything is already there. It go, and goes beyond uh, with the, the logic of relational database. The second main piece uh, was having a query language. Um, SQL uh, has been created. So COBOL was something that was used for, and, and then the, there were other languages that was more proprietary. But uh, SQL uh, was uh, something developed um, in the 80s, and, um, and it has been adopted by companies that are still there today, with uh, like Oracle, um, like IBM with DB2, Microsoft SQL Server, and these are still modern uh, solutions that we you probably uh, used uh, you know, yeah, at work, right? And and after that, we had open source solution that came uh, that were, were implementing SQL as well, like PostgreSQL, MySQL, and a few others, but just to name the one that we, we see uh, really often. Um, so relation re relational database and, and SQL. Um, yeah, from the 70s and still uh, going today. Talking about relational database uh, and about um, what we expect from database, I just wanted to jump there about in acid properties. Uh, who knows or who knows about acid properties? If I can ask, well, we are comfortable with acid properties. We don't. <laughs> Too familiar, yeah, sure. I know you, Hugh. <laughs> Hugh is working at Serial DB. He would not know the properties that would be an issue. Comfortable, okay. Read something, okay. So another another thing to read. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So acid stands for those four things: atomicity, uh, which is when you when you write a record. You know, with different columns, so we have different fields. We want all these fields to be written uh, uh, together in the record. In a column database, an example, you may write the column in a different place in the database, and you 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 could have one field with an information and another field that uh, failed to be written. So atomicity is this warranty of uh, having our record, even part of the record or a batch of record. To if, if the transaction has been accepted, uh, then it has been fully written. So this is atomicity. Uh, consistency. Consistency is about the constraint. It's about, in a relational model, um, if you have some dependencies, uh, depending, two tables, an example, 
uh, if you have, um, yeah, you have your invoice and invoice has aligned with a product, you cannot remove the product if if the destroy the product if the invoice a reference to product or yeah this is exactly what a relation database would do. Consistency is a way to say okay those two records in the two different tables are related and I want them to be to be to stay uh, related and uh, not, whatever what happened in the database system. Um, Isolation. Isolation is a transaction can be a group of uh, record, and uh, and uh, and there is a logic, right? You may write a record because a previous one contains some value. You want at one, you have you have sell a product. You want to remove the, the this product from your stock. So you are doing minus one in one field, as an example. So so all the all the, the transaction, all the, the statement and transaction are supposed to follow a logic and depend on the previous one. So the solution is a guarantee that uh, all these uh, update, uh, update the previous value as you were expected. And it comes with conflict and different things, but uh, isolation. Durability, uh, durability is once something has been written, so a transaction has been gone in the system, and then stay. Right, and it, it does not disappear anymore, even if we restart the, the server or whatever. So those are um, four principles that uh, are not so common in modern databases, and uh, we are going to see. Uh, and this is one of the challenge of uh, the new, the new era. And we are going to talk about recent technologies. Uh, no SQL databases. No SQL databases are. Most of the time, um, databases that does not support SQL, but the reason why they do that is because they simplify the model. Um, the goal is to go faster uh, or is to store more, and then we make um, sharding, for example. So we make different partition when we separate the data in different, uh, different nodes on the server. And, uh, and because it's difficult to be acid, uh, in a distributed environment, um, and sometimes we don't need it at all. And and this acidity, when you are in a distributed environment, make really things complex and slow down the process. So if you don't need it, there is no such thing than needed to be acid. So at some point there was this movement of NoSQL database where it was easy to have scalable database without too much guarantees, right? But uh, but we find another way to, to manage the things. So they are not acid, but they are fast, they scale well, they store gigantic uh, amounts of data. As an, as an example, Cassandra uh, is used by Apple for storing um, your the, the account on Apple Store as an, an example. And we know that they have a lot of accounts, right? <laughs> or, or issue of Apple Music or your your preference on Apple Music, your playlist on Apple Music, and imagine the number of playlists they have. So this is uh, quite a one instance of Cassandra that is able to manage that. And of course, there is sometimes surprise. Sometimes you may not discover your playlist, and, and 10 minutes after it appears again, you may have you, this experience. This is because uh, integrity is not 100% guaranteed. And don't, they don't lose data because they have a lot of replication, but sometimes they are not alive anymore. Some part of the data are not alive anymore because they are not acid. And an acid database will make you wait, say, and give you an error saying, oops, I cannot retrieve the content. I have a problem, you have to wait. So Cassandra will never make you wait. It will answer even if it doesn't have all the information. So this is this race of NoSQL database. And of no SQL database, yeah. And then you have uh, the new SQL database movement, um, uh, which bring back SQL, because SQL is not dead. <laughs> Definitely SQL is not dead. Um, that try to provide ACID guarantees as well, uh, even in distributed. So in the case, an example for uh, TIDB and TIKV, uh, it's, it's a case for many, um, Many cloud vendors are doing that. Google Spanner, CockroachDB is doing that. PerilDB goes uh, as well in this in this category. And um, and the idea is to say that SQL is still really really interesting for making queries. And uh, we cannot tell the opposite, right? Because there's still many people are using it uh, for relational uh, database. It's still useful jo making joins. Um, and uh, even if there is some other language, we are going to say that just after. But yeah. Uh, SQL databases. 
uh, those are really present today. Uh, I will talk about specialized database technology, really, I would say niche. They are sometimes really big niche. <laughs> In-memory database, Redis, of course, uh, which was uh, leading the, 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 the the memory database. SAP ANA is also one. SurilDB can also work in memory and in the browser. Uh, there is time series database. So databases that are dedicated to, to time series by the way they index, the way they store the data and, and the, the primitive they provide. Uh, graph databases, which is also a specific, uh, something specific because the way the data, are, it's, a, it's a graph, right? So it's a, you know, we can say a network. And uh, it goes also with a uh, language. Uh, you can confirm because you have been at uh, Neo4j, right? Uh, uh, Cypher is a language that we use at uh, Neo4j. It makes sense to have a different language, even if CyrilDB is now integrating uh, graph capabilities with SQL. So this is uh, another approach. And um, vector databases. So we are in this moment where AI um, is, of course, with ChatGPT and all, all those um, clones, uh, vector databases are everywhere. Uh, this is something that uh, is a game changer and it requires a database because we are going to store vectors. Uh, there is a way to interrogate the database to, to, to get the result and to, to get the closer vector. So there is indexes, there is a lot of field uh, a new field of algorithm. And so there is dedicated uh, database for that and face, Milvus, and I will DB as, as well support uh, um, uh, vector, uh, vector storage. Okay. Are you now in terms of timing? <laughs> I think we are in one hour now. Yeah, mm, I, you can continue. I can, we, I, have, we still have time. I, I'm 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 taking on questions, but yeah, okay. So I think it's about 10, 10 minutes to go to to the end, and um, and then we can we can go to to questions, or we can continue because I still have content. <laughs> okay, um, we talked about it previously. There is uh, these distributed database challenges. So uh, in in the current era, we have so many data that uh, uh, we cannot. So we, you are probably familiar with the concept of horizontally scaling and vertically scaling. Uh, so vertically scaling is uh, I have my software that runs my computer and I just add in my computer more, more CPU or more memory or more storage. And then I increase my, my capabilities. Uh, but uh, the biggest computer may not be able to handle, and it, this is exactly what happened to ChatGPT and, and to LLM and all those models where uh, the database cannot anymore uh, stand in a single computer. Not also, not not only because of storage, but also of the because of the computation. Um, uh, and then you need to put that in different servers. And then things become complex because um, uh, you need you need to see the whole database as a wall. And you need to insert data there, but then it has to go to really different servers to be distributed shared, replicated maybe. Uh, uh, so there is many mechanisms that then rely on things that are not as reliable at the computer. Um, in a normal database running in one server, you consider that the whole thing is, is uh, reliable. Right? And, and what the risk is to lose the, um, the power. Right? And, and for that, there is logic of uh, the way we store the town disk, there is there is even controversy there, but we we expect when we make a transaction that is written on disk, and if and if the we lost the power when the transaction is written, then we may just last uh, lose the last transaction. Okay, so there is these these things on 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 computers. In a distributed model, it's more complex because um, first your data, your only one record may be split in different servers. I mean, the first column may go in one server, the second column may go in another server. And this server that was storing the second field of your record uh, may shut down. And uh, so, okay, so there is a lot of um, uh, process to, to bring them and we, and we need to come up with new algorithms that, uh, re that rely, that give uh, reliability in a non-reliable world. So this is where Paxos and Raft um, um, have been uh, created for. So Paxos was been, has been created by Leslie Lomport, someone that um, 
provide this first. Basic Paxos is really interesting to learn. It's really simple to learn. Uh, there is more ad, more evol elaborated version of Paxos, but uh, everything starts with Basic Paxos. So uh, Paxos as a as a consensus algorithm. I, mean, I put a value in a Paxos environment, and I'm sure that this value has been either refused and accepted. And if it has been accepted, then it's on the system. Wherever I have only one server on 10, does not matter. It has been accepted. I, it, it's uh, durable right, to take the, the acid form of uh, durability. Uh, pack source. Then we have transactions. So everything related to acid is related to transactions. And, uh, and, and if we, we want to have all the warranties from acidity, then we need distributed transaction. And this is using a mix of Paxos and bringing things together. There is um, a different mechanism that are used. Uh, they are known for some of them as two-phase commit and three-phase commit. There is other one uh, that sometimes bring together the Paxos and the transaction. So, so there is a, a big field. And it's, if you have interest in this, there is still things to implement that have been written on some papers. There is still some uh, derivation to to uh, and some ideas to bring on the table regarding those uh, those topics. But there is vector clocks and long port timestamps, which is about synchronizing the servers. Because um, if you don't synchronize the server, uh, validating a transaction can be really slow because we, you you often rely on timestamp. So you want to have a mechanism that more or less synchronize the clock of the different servers. There is sharding and replication strategy. So all of those things uh, are part of just making a database working in a distributed way. And there is this cap theorem. There is one thing that you have to maybe get from this, uh, speak, this talk is the cap theorem. The cap theorem is this idea that you, in a distributed system, you cannot have both consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So every, uh, and this is still true today, who knows if tomorrow it will change, but today it is true that whatever um, the, that, the distributed database you decide to use, you will see that they are either more consistent available or available and partition tolerant, tolerant or partition tolerant and consistent, but they will not be able to provide uh, to be 100% efficient on the tree feeds. Cap theorem, there is also a, a version of this cap theorem. Um, I think it has been made by Amazon. I think it's pay sale. Uh, if you search for cap theorem, you will find this other, other one that uh, is more cloud aware uh, and uh, and make more, um, is more subtle in the way it, this was, cap theorem was pretty old and uh, and things evolved a little bit. So. The parcel one is a little bit more subtle and it's probably the next version of the cap theorem. Dis distributed database challenge. We have a few minutes. Two minutes, I want to, to give you just an algorithm that was uh, probably a foundation of, of many. And I want to explain the relationship between uh, between our drive and, and uh, hardware and software. And yeah. when we were... Is it fine for you? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Um, hardware and software. Uh, we talk about papyrus. We talk about uh, these old things, and uh, so hardware and software are related, right? I mean, it's something that, and if we think about computers. It's always, uh, if you look at what AMD, Intel is doing, it's really about even computing quantum computers. It's about uh, using physical layers and and bring software on top of them, right? So it's integrated. And I wanted to show the artist drive. The artist drive, which is still used today, um, have, uh, it was this uh, circle thing where the the surface was and still because still in use, a split in several um, sectors. Right? We just focus on the sectors, and a sector size here. At some point, you have this head that was moving in the right position, and then going down and writing something, and 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 um, and going up and going back in its place. So when you want to write something here, you have this head that was was traveling there, going there and writing here and going back. It may move a little a more clever way, but there is this movement, and this is exactly what latency is about. Latency is the moment where I'm going to move my head in the right position. And then you have the writing, and the writing is 
the, the disc rotating and the head is just there and the right. And when, uh, when we write, we don't write one byte, we don't write one bit or one byte, we are writing in one row uh, a sequence of bytes. So we are, and usually the size is two kilobytes or four kilobytes. So it's two kilobytes or four kilobytes of data. So it means that if you want to write just one byte, it will take the same time than if you want to write four kilobytes, because whatever you do, it's going to write a whole sector, right? So if you have a database with you just have value from zero to nine, and each value could, could be stored in just one byte, uh, you will, you could be tempted to say, okay, I, I write one one value each one by one, yeah. But then uh, you are going to write four kilobytes anyway, even if you are writing one byte. And this is where, so before, so I, we, we, I will not say, this is where B3 has been uh, created for. The idea between B3s is if I need to store just a single value, like seven, 16, that, that would be able to be stored in one byte. But oh, wait, I'm going to write anyway, uh, four kilobytes on data. So I could, I could write literally um, uh, 4,000 of those value in one row. It would be not cost me anything more. I mean, it would not cost more to write 4,000 4, 4, of these values than one. So the idea is to arrange them in a tree. And a B tree is a tree where each node contains um, uh, N values. So we could say, in our example, 4,000 of those values. And, and, and so reading 4,000 of these values or reading one is the same speed. And of course, if I have 12,000, then I'm going to use uh, uh, different nodes and, and it's divide and conquer, right? It's divide and conquer. And I'm going to store the, these keys um, in different nodes. If I'm looking for the value 21, I just need to read the first one. I see that there's seven sixteen. Oh, so twenty one is in the in the node after sixteen, and I go down to this, and I I read the second one, and I I should my I will find my value my value twenty one, but in this first level, by just making two reads, I have access to four thousand multiply four thousand right values. So in only two reads, I can read one million and six hundred thousand values. So this is the, the strength of B3. And this B3 was useful for um, magnetic disk, but it's still useful for, for many things. TCP IP, as an example, is using a buffer. If you don't use um, the world buffer, you are losing a part of your, uh, your capacities. There is, in fact, many aspects of, the, of a computer system, even uh, in network, even in a single uh, SSD storage, they see the same thing. There's many places where you may want to group this value together and to make to have the benefit of what we could, we could call that a batch of data, right? So B3 has been created because of this magnetic disk, but it's still now, uh, it has been derivated in many different instances, uh, depending on what you want to do. So we have air trees for geographic information. You have cadet trees for multi-dimensional, um, it's also for geospatial. Uh, you have Merkle trees. Merkle trees is uh, Bitcoins, is blockchains. So those are uh, the, the, get the legacy from the B3. And I will just give one, oh, yeah, I didn't put it in here. The metric tree is the one that is used today um, uh, in vector search. Vector search is based on met metric trees. And you have also HNSW, a hierarchical network with small vectors, which is a, a, absolutely a tree where we lose some information, but it doesn't matter. It's a tree, so it's a divide on cocoa logic. So it's exactly the same, uh, the same thing. I want you to finish with one thing. Because then, then we will have seen everything. The future of database technology. And I, I want to big back the, con the quantum computer. Because, and I will, I will have the slide and you, you will see, um, you, you can go to the, my, lock pro, my lock example. Maybe I have the time to talk about it. I don't know, you will decide. Uh, with quantum today, you have exactly the same thing. The, the quantum computer is exactly in the same stage 
the supercomputer we were talking about in the 60s is. Uh, it is a, a computer that comes with new paradigm, uh, with this logic of qubit. And by the way, I, I will talk about the qubit and not the qubit anymore. But uh, it's time now to find uh, the new B3, I mean, the equivalent of what the B3 has, has been for the previous computers that, that were based on magnetic storage and, uh, and memory and things. Uh, the qubit and the qubit require people to work on algorithm for the search to be efficient. And there is really, really opportunity there. There is already a first algorithm called the Grover algorithm. Grover's algorithm is a search algorithm that uh, works on qubit and qubit. And if, um, if um, you are in a stage in your career where you want to study something and, and maybe be part of some, or, or maybe a long journey, <laughs> because this is just the beginning, uh, that can be something uh, where the story I, I was just told, I, I just told you, uh, makes absolutely sense. And uh, what we are, we are going to build today with a quantum computer is the same story, is finding algorithms that fit with the paradigm that the country computer are bringing and the potential is absolutely crazy. I think I'm done. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It was very interesting. And I think like we've learned a lot today. Um, yeah, do we have any questions from participants? I have questions. What's the best book you would recommend for going deep in concepts of database and at the same time, like a deep and wide at the same time? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I didn't make my homework there, but um, so it depends on what you want to do, right? Um, I, I think you, you can maybe put in the chat uh, this book that um, Maxwell raised about databases i think if by chance if he's still here and if by chance um you you can put that on the chat there is a book about the technology around databases that are that, that is really well made and uh, hopefully we are going to to see it if we talk about data structures uh, so this is a book i don't know if you can see it maybe you can see uh this is, this is the, the book that when, when you are engineer, young engineer, you're supposed to have at some point the common, right? Where most of the data structure that we still use today are, 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 are explained there. Uh, what is not done there is the relationship between the algorithm and the, and the, they don't spend too much time in explaining the reason why these algorithms are alive, and why they've been created. Uh, usually they, they make a, a quick, uh, introduction so but but they are there as soon as you know which algorithm you you uh, which algorithm could be interested in, in to solve the use case you have uh, then this book is really um, uh, a good a good entry point but yeah i i, I did not make my whole my homework there i, no I can probably put some um, collect information because we yeah I have, I have a few books in, in mind that I could uh, put um, after in common somewhere I don't know where but you will tell me you know yeah okay uh, I oh, it's been... into the introduction to algorithm sorry I just see the, the question from Poppy it's introduction to algorithms the author are common I think it's known at the common but it's common lasers on reversed and uh, Clifford Stein. This is the third edition. I'm not sure it's the last one, but it does not change a lot. Clifford Stein, yeah? Yeah, I think I found it. Yeah, I found it. And I, I see that Lizzie as well. Too. Lizzie put, uh, and you put some reference at the one I was, I was talking about, yeah. Here we go. And yeah, there is a question like, uh, could you share somehow slides with participants? Share some, so that you can get? Slides, slides. 
Oh yeah, sure, absolutely, absolutely. I I will uh, I will, I will share it. I mean, I need to do so because uh, mm -hmm. we we didn't see in detail some some of the things. So you can see them in the slide. And I'll repeat once where there is question related to them after. Pleasure. Yeah, cool. I will ask another question. Uh, like always, databases. It's for very. It's very important for data engineering profession right now, which is also will be explored because all this data we need for IE technologies, they are so popular right now, but how they could exist without big data, yeah, without all the storages and etc. So what would you say about it? Like, what do you think, um, for example, we need to learn to become good data engineers to build these pipelines and storages for uh, data scientists to be able to extract features from it very quickly. Well, it's a it's a long story, right? So uh, I'm 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 not too much into the ecosystem of the database in terms of um, consuming them, using them in day to day. So uh, in SuperDB, I'm working uh, on implementing some of those algorithms. For for actually, I'm working on the indexing part, and and of course, the goal is to to provide the primitives and uh, uh, so for for sure um, uh, at some point you need to embrace the ecosystem right and, and see what are the there is there is a, a moment of trend uh, Elasticsearch as an example has been a solution that was uh, absolutely trendy trendy in the, in the in 2010 until 2020 it's probably more now uh, more and more niche because we see new platform coming um, uh, and, and new logic of uh, scaling data. So the vector database came to something. But if you look at platform like Foundation DB, like TIKV, if you look at Cockroach DB, uh, if you if you look at Redis Enterprise, I mean those platforms uh, that are um, uh, using that start usually with key value store and start with uh, pretty. Good algorithm. The cockroach DB, as an example, starts with Raft. The idea was to use Raft, uh, take PostgreSQL as a, as a reference, and not only a reference because they implement the protocol from PostgreSQL, uh, so you can use the client from PostgreSQL to 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 operate and interoperate with cockroach DB. Um, uh, so what I want to, to say with this is that. Finally, SQL is still a really good thing to to be aware of, and um, and I don't see um, any no SQL attempt um, uh, taking the lead there. So SQL is still uh, omnipresent. There is some dialect of SQL. So I think if you want to invest in something, it's probably um, in invest in this language because it's it's everywhere. Even Cassandra is using a, a dialect of, of SQL, and there will there. We will always have the need for a query language because database is about storing, it's about scaling, it's about the, the quantity of data you can put inside. But the query language is the way you operate, interoperate with the data. And it matters because you have to solve questions. And, and the, the language does not come only with the way you query it, but it also comes um, with the way it has been implemented. Because when we do at SerialDB, the language and what we implement behind is totally related. And uh, we cannot, we, as an example, we don't do joins because we don't implement joins in the same way. So we have another way to, to handle relation, which is pretty interesting and, and cover uh, more efficiently many use cases. Uh, but then we don't provide join in the language. We provide another syntax that let's let collect um, uh, connected entities to, to, to the other one. So the implementation as a language are, um, are closed. And so I think learning SQL, learning SQL be, be good in SQL, uh, will make you good as well in understanding the way database work. And um, and that, that's true for modern database. Uh, a platform like CockroachDB is using SQL, SuriDB is using a dialect of SQL. Um, Elasticsearch uh, has invested a lot in the last two, three years in, in a new language, which is a SQL-like language uh, for making a request. And they struggle a little bit in implementing um, what, is, what is supposed to be under, right? Because then, they, as I, I told you, it was, it's related. So yeah, I, I think investing in SQL uh, is, a, is a good thing. Uh, 
yeah and and then uh, then everything um uh related to the to the ecosystem we are embracing right each time you go for something sql or sql yeah sorry i think i i'm, I'm using sql is all the way to say it right i just see cesar uh, comment on the chat uh, there's sql yeah, yeah, yeah. and sql i think i'm, I'm i can the, the, i can the share way. that I can show that in my company in um, toilets, we have uh, cheat sheets for SQL. So the idea is that everyone who enter our company, everyone ever should uh, know about SQL, like whatever it's a data analyst or like a engineer or it's ops manager, like operations support manager, product owner, okay. everyone should know SQL. That's why we have cheat lists everywhere. So yeah, I would say like now it's kind of basics. Uh, I have one more question for you. Uh, you have so many years in the market and I would ask uh, like how actually you uh, keeping up to date with technologies like uh, read articles, read news or like of a space uh, in some conference, like what is the best advice to be like, keep up to date, like to keep heads up, like and see what is happening and don't be overwhelmed at the same time. Yeah. So in, in my case, you got it right from, from the presentation. It's something I do uh, not only professionally, but as a hobby, right? So if, I, if I'm not at work, uh, working on those things, uh, my brain is still uh, trying to collect information and get information. But um, uh, in my in my career, I I mostly learn when I was experimenting. So I I did the wrong way at some point. You know, I, I start the, the presentation by saying we should learn from the past first, and and then you can go further because you spend you just spend less time in reinventing the wheel. And I did that at the beginning. So, so I learned the hard way because at some point I was thinking, done, um, I'm already in my 30s and I see this young guy that already knows things that I just discovered last year. Right? So, so, so it matters, of course, to, to see where the state of the art is and, uh, and spend time in learning from your pair. So what you are doing here now with Women Who Code uh, matter, of course, being part of this kind of session because uh, you may not learn as in deep as people that that work on that but you are learning about something that is existing and then you can you can raise uh or ring a bell right you can say okay uh i have this need now i know that this is existing now i can go deep in and try to learn these things and so yeah uh, um meet up uh all the information is available everywhere right? so the, the probably YouTube is a, is a I mean, all the social platforms are are useful. Uh, all the documentation, all the scientific papers. It was not the case. I remember when I started downloading PDF with my computer of modem. You know, and it took s sometimes twelve hours to download four megabytes PDF. <laughs> so today everything is available. Right, we have all the scientific paper available. So. Be curious, search, use Google, use ChatGPT, uh, use uh, all those tools that are available and dig in. I mean, I mean, uh, dig in and, and you will find really treasure. And, and when, um, if we talk about distributed databases, when I, I was talking about uh, what we need to, to do, I mean, there is today all those papers or recent papers of uh, PhD, uh, uh, written by PhD that are available that you can read if you don't do a PhD by yourself you can still that, make that late right uh, and uh, so yeah so be curious and uh, all the information is there and uh, maybe the, the risk to data is too much information it's maybe difficult sometimes to 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 find what is uh, uh, interesting and what is not but when you talk about that database data structure there is less content already and uh, and they are usually in in pretty um, um, pretty well known place, right? So so yeah. So social networks, asking questions, going in meetup, uh, uh, see the um, the conferences because you often uh, learn things. Papers are usually published when the work is done, right? So so if you want to be uh, to be uh, early on the thing, then you probably have to look at conferences because often conferences, people are talking about things they are working in. 
before the paper has been has been published. So yeah, conferences, online conferences, as an example. Thank you so much. It was very inspiring. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's it. And again, thank you so much for this presentation. It was very interesting. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you again. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for having Bye. me. <laughs> Bye -bye. Yeah, and I see a lot of thank you. And it was very interesting talk. Yeah, so great job, great job. Thank you, I don't give you too much content, but, uh, but I, I, the, the one hour exercise, I'm less, I, I'm more, more in the half an hour exercise. So I was not sure for the one hour and an half exercise. So, yeah, too much content. Well, think... Starting it with how many databases it's for Mark, it was, <laughs> Genius, <laughs> to be honest. Did, <laughs> really. did, 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 did you guess? Did you know? No, I, yeah, I don't know. It was funny, yeah, between one and. <laughs>